This is your host, Tim Winders, coming to you as usual from the passenger seat of our RV Theo somewhere in the United States in North America. We've got a great interview today. Today, we are going to be heavy duty discussing leadership with our guest. I'll get to the introduction in just a moment, but before I do, as always, I would love to encourage you to continue the conversation with us not just listen in on the conversation that we're going to have today, but continue the dialogue afterwards. We have so many places that you could do that. First place you could go is to seekgocreate.com. Go to our website there and make sure we have your best email address because we'll keep you updated on new episodes. But you can also read additional notes, get additional resources from this episode there. And you can also comment on, uh, on the episode page. Other places you could find us, we are Seek Go Create on all the socials, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, let's see where else, uh, Instagram, you could find us in all those places. We're even on Clubhouse now, we do some things there. So make sure you find us, connect with us and continue the dialogue. I love talking about studying, participating in all things leadership. And our guest today is what I consider, sometimes I don't throw around the word expert a lot. Expert's kind of an, an odd word in the culture we're in today. This is an expert in leadership today, and she has so much wisdom. Let me read this bio just so you know all about Jennifer. We have Jennifer Mackin as our guest. She has over 25 years experience shaping the way leaders do business. She's the principal and CEO of Oliver Group and president and partner of Leadership Pipeline Institute US. And she's worked with thousands of leaders and entrepreneurs across all industries, including, but not limited to, healthcare, hospitality, government, and financial services. Jennifer, welcome to Seek, Go, Create. Thank you, Tim. I'm really looking forward to talking about these really important topics today. Thanks for having yeah. me. Yeah, it's great to have you. We're going to we're going to do a deep by, dive, but I, I warned you about this. The listener knows. First question I like to ask, aside from the bio, and you had a bio that I could have kept going, but I'm uh, glad you didn't. <laughs> yeah, I know. You've got a lot of stuff you and you've got a book we're going to discuss. I read that yesterday. So, but aside from the bio, you and I meet somewhere and we're just chit chatting and I say, Jennifer, what do you do? What do you typically tell people? Yeah, it's really hard to summarize. Um, but the way I would describe what we do is if you think about all the complexity and chaos around us today, that's really always been there, uh, will be there. I, we help leaders, senior teams and leaders across an organization make sense of that. Um, and we help them select and develop those people to be ready for whatever is going to be coming in the future. Okay. I, I love that. And just so you know, when I'm looking down, I'm taking notes here as we talk, I've got questions, I've got notes, but typically when someone starts with their elevator pitch, like you do, I get other questions that start firing. Yeah. And I've free. already got, and I've already gotten an <laughs> off an off uh, script question. You mentioned the chaos and complexity yeah. of the culture that we're in. And I think I recently did a, a solo podcast episode on just uh, being reactive instead of proactive. And, and that's a big theme. It's something that I've observed in myself and others over the last year. But just discuss with us briefly, because I know you've got your hands in a lot of organizations. Talk about what you've seen in the last 18 months you know, pandemic, political, you know, uh, let's just say race, all the things that are going on. And of course, we're going to relate that to leadership, but how has that impacted leaders? That's a big question because it's multifaceted and huge impact. So um, I would say that, that a couple of things come to mind when you ask me that, and, and it's about the pace of change that's, mm -hmm. cha that's different than maybe two years ago or, or more. So things are happening to us even faster than we're used to dealing with. And things that impact everyone, not just a group of people. So that's different. That creates complexity um, in the sense of um, everyone's responding to it differently. And so 
we are figuring things out as we go much more than we ever have been. So the, mm. one of the bigger things I've seen is, is people having to step back and reflect and think, okay, now how do I respond? Now what do we do? Um, and so we're just not on stable ground very much in the last 18 months. We think we have a handle on working remotely and then there's civic unrest going on in our city. And then you've got, you know, you think you've got a handle on um, leading remotely and then we start wanting to come back to the office. So it's just, it's just a lot at once. So I think it's more chaotic and more complex than it's been ever before that I, in my lifetime. Yeah. And, and, I, and I guess that's one of the things I love that you added that very last sentence, because it kind of feeds right into what I was going to say in, in your lifetime, right. because I, I think back and I, I think I even shared this in, in a recent uh, episode or teaching that I did, you know, we're not the only generation that's ever dealt with challenge. I mean, I think back to if we were living in 1941 or 1932 or, you know, 1864, all of those in the U S or anything like that, I would think there would be a lot going on, but it just seems like, and, and I think you use the word pace. It seems like the pace or the volume of information. I, I don't know what it is. It just seems like it's worse uh, what are, I mean, other than pace, I mean, I guess social media kind of comes to mind. What are some of the technology. other technology? Yeah. Technology. Talk yeah, a little yeah. bit about that. That comes to mind when I think of, um, what's different from historical pandemics. And I mean, we've had them before, um, you know, so technology is informing us. It is supporting us in our ability to communicate like this, um, and it makes things come at us faster. You know, we have more outlets to go to for information than we ever have been. And I, you know, and that's due a lot to technology and a lot to just a lot of information out there. So sorting through that is, is more difficult. Uh, for me personally, it's, it's finding some positive news out there. We all need that motivation as well. And it's so negative. Um, and so, and, and depressing at times. So that that's different. Technology is different. I think we're living differently. As I just am kind of thinking on the top of my head, people are living alone more than they ever have. And, and maybe when we've gone through other things um, in other generations, we've had people around us, our family around us much more. So I think that's changed. I think, you know, from a religious standpoint, there are less people going to church. There are less people, you know, seeking answers through that means. Um, so big differences. Yeah. And I, 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 at times I don't want to act like one of these people that says, this is, I'm going to exaggerate a little bit. Things are, they've never been this bad. They've never been, but, <laughs> but, they, but they are different. I love the way mm -hmm. you, you bring that up and technology is so awesome at times. And I use the term, it's a blessing and it's a curse because we've mm -hmm. got these devices that are attached. I'm pointing to my phone and everything in front of me and we've got access to all these things. Um, okay. I got another big picture question for you. I'm, I'm hitting you with some big stuff here. Hey. One of the things that I wonder about being a kind of a leadership, I call myself a leadership junkie. Do we really have good leadership examples in our world today? And I know that's a loaded question mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm expecting you to say that hopefully you work with a lot of great ones, but, but let's look at what, with what we see in general, and I'm not asking one political or the other, or one type or anything like that, but just in general, what are our examples like? Well, I think that, um, you know, I always go to political examples and, and big picture without, you know, any sort of naming. I think it's, it's tough to find someone that you say, I want to be like them. You know, I want to lead like them. They're leading in a way that I can get excited and behind and, um, and optimistic, see my future, you know, all of that is, is missing. Um, I think sometimes the reporting that's done today is on some of the negative aspects of leadership, but I do see wonderful leaders out there and, and most of them care deeply 
about people that work with them and they're doing their very best that they can. I do believe that too. And leadership is a journey. None of us have arrived and are, you know, can check that off and say, yes, I've got all of these leadership things, right? So, yeah. um, so I look to certain leaders for certain things and others for other things and then learn from where I see it really done poorly. And that's how I at least try and improve myself over time. Yeah. And, and I love that. That was a very diplomatic answer too, by the way, because, because I, I do think, I mean, and you know, we could look at the political example before we move off of it. I do think that there are probably some really good qualities from just about anyone you could pick. I, I would like to think there's good in everyone. Maybe that's what mm -hmm. I'm saying it, that if we take one political party, their leader that's currently president, formerly president, whatever, I would like to think that they've got some qualities and then the other side, I could do the same. I do yeah. think that the nature of our media is to focus on the flaws, the negative. And, and I also think that makes it tough for that leader to do whatever it is they're trying mm -hmm. to do. And anyway, I would agree. It, and I would also say that, you know, it's all they're They're as good too, as the people around them. So yeah. I also say, you know, um, let's look to who else is not, the front person, but kind of behind the scenes in a leadership role too, that gives you more of a full picture of right. the situations that you're reading about or hearing about. Sure. So, all right. So now I'm going to, I'm starting to get back on script a little bit. I'm just, I'll give you a little bit of a path we're going. You, okay. you, you wrote a book called leaders deserve better. And I want to get into that. I actually want to go into, you have a about four points that you make in that, that I'd love for us to discuss briefly, probably mm -hmm. as we wrap up. So I'm giving the list sure. a little glimpse of where we're going. But one of the things that I love to do when I have someone with your background and expertise is I love to get perspectives, definitions of, of leadership. So before we go much farther, could you e either textbook definition or your own words definition? How do you define or describe leadership? Because it kind of gets to be a big umbrella in the world we're in. And I think sometimes it can get a little bit muddied. How do you define it? And I define it more in the corporate world or the business world um, as um, people that they're, where their first job, their number one job, is to develop people. And I know that sounds basic. Um, a leader is one that develops other people. A leader is one that sets the stage, um, helps define where we're headed and connect individuals to that to say, what's my part in all of this? So that to me is fundamental. And then there are different levels of leader in organizations that's that further defines what their role is, what they're there to do, whether you're the most senior person to a new leader. And those those differ, which we can get into if you want to. But that's my my overarching what I would say. Yeah. And we're there to inspire. Right. I love I love that. Um, and, and it's so interesting that some of these things really are simple but they're not easy because developing yeah. people, it's just like, so it really, what's that even tongue. mean? Yeah. You, know, you, you said it so well, but yet it's perplexing. See, one of the things that I've done in some of the leadership training I've done here on the podcast, and I even go back 30 plus years to some things is that I really like to point to everyone and say that they are a leader over some realm uh, you know, mm. if it's, if it's a single mom, that's got a, that's got one child that they're attempting to inspire and raise up and develop, they've got a leadership position, possibly a more important leader, pos leadership position than any of us can imagine. But, uh, but sure. I, I, I love that. And you may not know, I actually spent some time, I was with the Bell South Leadership Institute a few years after I, I came out know. of Georgia Tech. Yeah, it was, uh, it, it really kind of helped me develop my my leadership chops a little bit, maybe. Right, right. But uh, all right, so so I want to go down more of that corporate route that you talked about. We can definitely yeah. have conversations with about that. But 
one of the, I think the under, one of the underlying premises, maybe stated or unstated in your book, in Leaders Deserve Better, is that we, in many ways, haven't been doing it right for a long period of time. We've struggled with it, and, and we've got the results to show it. There's some good results, not great results. And so I want to get to the ways that you have implemented to help improve that. But yeah. I sometimes like to dig and try to find out why we are where we are mm. now. And one of the things I wrote on my notes, uh, I, and maybe I'll pose this in the form of a question, answer as best you can. Sure. But, uh, but to me, it's one of these almost unanswerables, but maybe you can at least give some perspective. I'm always concerned that our systems, and let's just say our systems, our education, our family system, mm. even our business and work system, our political systems that we talked about earlier, it's my observation that we may not be preparing people to lead. And so I'm going to kind of throw that over to you, that little softball to you and just let you take that and run with it. Um, thoughts on that? I mean, we're, you know, we've got people that are going through 12 years of school and then four years, six years, eight years more, they're coming into these environments. Yeah. We're, we're telling them you need to develop people and we've never shown them how to do any of that. So talk about that hey, for a while. You, you are speaking my language because I think that's, <laughs> that's why we are where we are partially today is that okay. where do you learn these things? I went to business school, grad school. I look at other grad programs. Very few have anything about being a leader in the way we're talking about it. So, and that happens within organizations. So then you get out of your education, wherever that is, you go into the business world, it's seven years before the, uh, on average, before a leader gets any sort of development on what it means to be a leader. That's crazy. Where else do we do that? And, and you know, any, any other role in our world, do we do that? So I think we're putting everyone at a disadvantage that way. Um, I think that we always know how to teach the functional expertise, how, uh, how to be a good uh, financial, look at financials, how to um, deal with accounting or communication or sales, you know, some of the functional aspects of our business, those are easier to teach. And it's really difficult to teach leadership. And then you could be right on with your content because I don't think the content has changed a whole lot, meaning what it has, what good leaders need to know in order to be effective hasn't changed a ton. We've always needed to communicate. We've always needed to set standards, talk about performance, look at their futures. So, um, so when I look at education and I look at systems, um, I don't think we're learning that unless we're learning it through life. So, cause I think about, I've always been a leader and, and to your point, you could be leading a thing or a project, you know, or whatever, but even leading people, um, I did that at an early age. And, and so I learned by doing, that's the only way, or by observing, right, the other people. It's the only way we're coming into the work world knowing how to do this. What even is this? Because when you look at job definitions, and I'll stop after this, um, when you look at job definitions, they only have the functional aspects in it more than not. You need to get these results. You're in charge of this department. You need to have these skills, right? Not your job is preparing other people to be their best, to reach their potential, to learn more, to work together. You know, so it's really missing. The, the whole definition is missing. Yeah. So, so then you and your organization comes into a company where there's a group of people that are in the, anywhere from their mid twenties to their possibly mid sixties. And then you are asked to help these leaders do better. Um, that's Tim's words. I know there's more technical aspect to it. No, oh, that's a great way um, to put it. It's, it's almost as if it's a, it's a big cultural and educational challenge, right? I, I noticed that in my brief time when I was at Bell, Th Bell South Leadership Institute, we were attempting to almost reprogram people that had been programmed from an early age, but- uh, Interesting, it, yeah. So it, yeah, I mean, it was such an odd, odd thing and it, and it really makes it 
and we're going to go into it because I, I I broke down as I was reading through it, and I've got some notes on it, y'all's um, the the methods and ways you guys do it, and I think it's excellent. I love it, and there's a, a few pieces of it that I was that I was really digging it, and we'll we'll talk about that later. But there's one thing you mentioned that I like. I want to back up. I want to go back even further. You mentioned that you observed that you were a leader even from a young age, right? And oddly enough, not oddly enough, I guess, I, I guess I noticed that too. And, and I don't know why. And I don't, I mean, I've thought about it. I mean, you know, I was, I went to a little elementary school outside of Atlanta and I was the president of the elementary school and I was president of the senior class in high school. And I learned a little bit in sports and stuff like that. But at what point did young Jennifer look around and go, hmm, there's some people that seem to be following me. <laughs> yeah, did you, yeah. How did you know it? And, and were you aware of it? Um, no, I don't think I was aware of it at the time to answer that question. But I, I, I think it was also grade school for me. Um, captain of teams, um, you know, always volunteering, you know, uh, for things, whatever it was. It was kind of like, Jennifer, do you want to? And before they even got it out, sure. I want to try it. You know, so I think it is that hunger and seeking out of experiences and things. I grew up in a rural area um, where after coming out of that area, I realized, you know, I hadn't been exposed to that much, but I was exposed to as much as I could have been, I think. And I had, <clears throat> and I grew up with parents who also were leaders. And I think there was just kind of, that's just how we do things a little bit. And so, um, you know, I also attribute it to, you know, I think about my, um, my church experience and I always sang and I always wanted to be in the choir, but I also, I always wanted to be the one up front. <laughs> and so, I don't know, that says something different about me than necessarily leadership, but, um, you know, I was always seeking the challenge, I guess, is my point. Cause I was never, I was never the best, but I always wanted to, to do it whatever it was. So I think I, I learned that early and I put myself out there willing to fail. I will also say, you say, I don't, I don't know why I am this way. What I've also learned through my work and through assessments is that smaller part of the population wants it, seeks it, likes it. It being that person who is taking the heat, who is taking the risk, who is you know, saying, let's go this way. It's not easy. It's harder than waiting mm -hmm. for, you know, for most people, it is really hard and it comes with a lot of responsibility. Right. Um, so you have to want that too. So it's complex. I think to your point, it's hard to know um, what all makes up a person who wants to, to be a leader. Which, which then brings up, I, I'm actually, some of these could be controversial, but we'll, we'll have fun with it. I think we'll do it with a smile on our face. I'll ask this with a smile sure. on our face. Was Jennifer born a leader? Mm. No, I don't. I think it's, I think it is a mix. I really do believe um, that I've learned that, you know, people will adapt and can if they want to. So in order to adapt, you have to really be motivated to you have to have some of the skill sets to do it, and you have to have a little bit of intellect to do it. Those are typically the three things I have found that if you, if a leader says, I want to change, or someone says, I want that leader to change, or I want that person to change, those are the, the common things that get in the way or um, help someone make that change. So, yeah, I, I think it's um, born in the sense of there are things that we do from the beginning that you go, gosh, how are they so different from their siblings, from their parents, whatever it is. And that's the born component. But I think there's a learned component too. So I don't mean to straddle that middle and pick both, but I do think it's both. I can't, I can't say it's one way or the other. What do you yeah, think? Well, I, I absolutely agree with you because for every example of a Jennifer that, you know, when she walked in kindergarten, you know, 
people gravitated to her around the coloring table and said, oh, you know, or whatever. They, they were looking you for advice or they were asking you questions. You just had that presence in the room for whatever reason. It could mm -hmm. be the, the way you walked in and the way you communicated or smiled or, you know, I've even noticed that sometimes height impacts people's leadership mm. you know someone who's six foot five walks into a room where a bunch of 511 it's almost like people immediately look to them and i'm not taking anything away from skill or anything i'm just saying sometimes they are just unique things for every right. example like that there's there's a joe that at 38 years old has been kind of going along in just a low level position that something clicks he has an idea a thought starts a company and within five years He's leading a group of 300 people and doing it well, you know, and, he, you know, you go back and look at his. So I'm sure you've seen examples like that. So I don't think there's an answer. I love that we hopefully debunked the myth for people that might be sitting there going, OK, I'm not a leader. I'm, what I'm really wanting the listener to do is to hang around. <laughs> to listen well, <laughs> or I think it's OK to say I don't want that if you know what leadership is. So I'm always telling companies, we have got to define more than one path, not just a leadership mm. path, because that's what then success is. There's another path, right? There's an expert path, someone who just gets really good at their craft, um, shares their expertise, influential. Um, that's a whole nother path that really doesn't get discussed a whole lot. So mm -hmm. if we tell people up front, these are the paths, this is what it looks like. What do you want? And they say, I don't want to sign up for leadership. That to me is a win. Yeah. And, and leadership, you know, could mean different things and you could be a leader within your space and all of that. But when I talk about leading people, I think it's okay to say, I don't want that in my career. And you can be yeah. very successful without having said that. Yeah, I, the power in that, Jennifer, is for people to identify what they, this is my words, were created to do. Yeah. And I think, some, I think sometimes that changes. I mean, over the course of my life now, you know, there's been times I've been in probably roles that were leadership roles that I needed to be in and should have been in. And they're there are probably times that I just needed to sit towards the back of the room and be more of a participant. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. what I would do during those times, many times is I would still try to lead. That's not a healthy thing to do either. Right. We won't go down, right. we won't, we won't go down that road. That's Tim. <laughs> okay. That's Tim exposing some of his issues. Um, I do want to ask, <laughs> I do want to ask some general, I guess, I don't know if it's guidance tips, uh, just thoughts that you have. I do know that we've got a group of listeners. First of all, we've got some listeners all over the world. We've got a, a large group of listeners in India. So we've got cross cultures. Maybe we'll right. get to that in a moment. But I know that we have a, a healthy number of what I would call young leaders, yeah. leaders that may be, you know, they look around and they don't see people that they can influence or see people that they can, you know, develop but they perceive that they are being prepared for a leadership role or prepared mm. for something in the not too distant future. What advice or tips or encouragement could you give to the person that right now is looking around going, you know, I think I'm created to lead. I just don't see it now. What can I be doing or thinking about or preparing for the future? So many things. Um, thanks for that question because um I don't think a lot of younger or new career, new to their career individuals um, get a lot of support to know how to how to navigate this, right? Mm -hmm. As similar to leaders don't get what they need to lead. Um, so I would say first and foremost, it's about self-awareness. Get as much awareness about yourself. You know, you know yourself in a lot of ways better than the better than most, and you know kind of what, what your strengths are, what you enjoy, um, but also get some objective information from, uh, and get some information from others about you, you know, and continue to mm -hmm. seek that. Because I think the more that we can go toward things that really take advantage of that, even early on, even if it's not what we ultimately want to do, it is going to prepare us for what's next, whatever that is. So self-awareness is really important. I think not being intimidated by leadership, um, meaning that having a relationship with the person that you report to, having relationships 
to those who are technically above you um, so that you can learn what are they doing? What are they not doing? You know, ask questions. That could be a mentor. That could be just somebody that you say, hey, can I just grab a cup of coffee with you and talk to you about it? Because I find that those who haven't been in the workforce don't even know what's possible. What is out there? What are all the job opportunities? What could I do? So if you can talk to people and say, what are your path? What was your path? You can say, I want to sign up for that, or I don't want to sign up for that. But what they'll also find is it is not a straight line. Almost never is it a straight line to, oh, I said, I want to lead a company. I said, I want to write a book. I certainly did not say those things early on. Um, so what I was gaining along the way enabled me to say, yes, this is what I want to do. This is what I could be good at. So um, having that relationship and talking often with your boss and documenting what are you accomplishing and communicating that. People don't want, they, they're humble more than not. They don't want to have to tout themselves. Well, shouldn't my leader know? Well, especially leaders that have a lot of people that work with them on their team, it's really difficult, right, to, to know what everyone's doing and who really led that project. And um, so what are you learning? Um, what do you need also? It's really hard. Um, you know, I, I would love employees to take upon themselves to create their development plan. Like, what do you need to move to this next level? Well, often they don't know what they don't know. You know, I don't know what I need. I just know that I want to learn and I know. So lastly, I would say sign up for whatever is happening around you. Is that being on a committee for something? Um, Asking your boss, what are they working on? How could you help? You know, is there anything you could do? You know, so really just kind of going outside of what you know and, and what your job description is will set you so far apart. So I hope that helps. No, those are excellent. I love that. I was taking some notes here and I, I, I may have lost a point or two, but we've got it recorded so I could come back to it. So that's, that's very good. <laughs> and I know, I, and in fact, I really love that first one, self-awareness, because it's, I think that's foundational to success just in general. Um, mm -hmm. I'm even, I'm even about to do strength finders again, because mm -hmm. my wife tells me she's a big proponent of it, that mine may have adjusted some over mm -hmm. the years. And so it's like, okay, I'll, I'll take strength finders just to be more aware of yeah. who I am. And take anything you can get your hands on. I say, yeah, you know, one of the things, and I, we, we wade into some topics that are a little deeper here, but one of the things that in general over the last 30, 40, 50, whatever plus years, uh, it, we are told and the metrics show it that leadership positions, corporate especially, political also, are typically dominated by white males. Mm. And yes. And so this is this is kind of Tim's way as a white male of kind of going yeah. into this diversity conversation, because what's interesting about it, Jennifer, I'll just share this, is that I think back to my corporate experience, which has been 20 plus years ago, and I probably in nine years of working corporate had probably nine different jobs. I moved around a good bit. I was destined to be an entrepreneur, <laughs> which is one of the reasons why I migrated out of yeah. that. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't remember any of the male bosses that I had, but I remember two of the females. Hmm. And, and that was in the early 90s. And I think I'm generalizing here, but I think people will get the statement. I think people know how strong females, in, and I'm generalizing, are at developing people. That definition you just gave us earlier of leadership. Why do we not have more females in those roles, especially at higher level, corporate, at the top of the food chain and all. Um, is it systemic? Is it because people like me are preventing them? And I'm anything's fair game here. So yeah. why is it? Is it just, is it just culture? What's going on? Yeah, it is all of that. Um, so <laughs> yeah, there are some people that naturally, well, we all naturally go to people who are like us. It just, it is a natural thing. Um, and that's where comfort is. 
Okay. So to, to do something differently, we have to not, we have to get outside of that comfort. Um, so yeah, there are some people that will only go for white males because they feel comfortable there um, and have proven success there. I think that's becoming less and less. I think people in general in business have understanding of the importance of diversity broadly. Um, and the numbers show that if you have women on your board, if you have women in leadership roles, the company does better. I would suggest that if you have women and people of color and people of different religions, even different, um, just different, everybody, I heard something recently from a woman, um, Sarah Jenkins Roberts. Um, she was talking about diversity with me and and she said, it's really about thinking about how do you work and do you have every one of those types of people at the table while you're doing that work? Because you need, if you don't, you at least need to understand perspectives or you're not doing your company a service. So I'm, I diverged over there, but um, why there are less women also is cultural for sure, at least in cultures that I've learned about. It's, you know, we tend to be the ones that take the, the primary role at home, the primary role with our parents, um, and we won't sacrifice that to a certain point, at least. Um, and, and we make less because of systemic problems of, of pay. So when looking at my husband makes more than me, if one of us has to leave, it, it's gonna be me. And then so, and we also have the children, right? I mean, we can't get around the fact that we need to leave the workplace if we wanna have a family, which takes us out for a period of time. Now, sometimes it's only a few months, other times people are out for a few years. So jumping back in. So what we know is that first level leaders, it's 50-50 men, women, and then it's horribly um, poor, less than 10%, I believe, in the senior teams. Um, so that's what happens. Some of that happens, a life happens in between, and it's just how our society works. Yeah. Um, so those are the, some yeah. of the things I think get in the way. I do see it changing. And listen, let's go ahead and add in, <laughs> I, I hate to do this, but it, let's say, diversity is anything other than the white white males that have somewhat ruled things for a long period of time but yeah i i think back jennifer this has been this has been discussed now in 1987 88 when i graduated <laughs> from georgia tech i remember sitting around a table with a lot of other engineers there mm -hmm. was 21 guys i think almost all white and one female and the guy hiring for the large corporation that was there says, by the way, we're going to hire as many women as we do males. And I remember looking around going, wow, the pool doesn't seem to equal. That's here. true. That's and true. I, it isn't. I, rem I remember that to this day. So it's like now we're going on. And I've, I just really aged myself. And are we getting closer? Are we getting better? Are some of our solutions working? Give us some hope here that we're getting back to this. <laughs> there is, we, we, are, we are in the sense of, I do think more people are aware of how we got where we are today, mm -hmm. um, which that is, we, we always learn that if you learn history, mm -hmm. you know what to do in the future or what not to do. And I think that's, that's improving. Um, I think it was very progressive for your boss to say that um, that long ago. Um, and it's more of a global companies have been doing this a long time. So I will also say, let's look to the way they do it. Um, so we're making, we're taking steps in the right direction. We know that training is important. We know that in, um, expanding our circles, expanding who we, who we know will help. Um, being intentional about we're going to increase the pool, we're going to find diverse people in different places. Um, but the pool issue is a big one in the sense of we can't just create that overnight. That goes back mm -hmm. to our education systems, um, mm -hmm. our health care, you know, just all kinds of things that get in the way of people being at their best. Um, so 
I love the awareness. I love that companies are putting it in the in their plans, which we've never had before, um, and they're bringing in experts because the the numbers aren't moving. Even though we've been putting programs in place of bias and diversity inclusion programs, and that's kind of the heart of of what I think is wrong with development. Those are good things. Those are really good courses. I took a couple with one of the boards I'm on. It's great information. If you don't do anything, if you don't reinforce that knowledge, if you don't change the way we do things systemically and our culture is, it's it's gonna fail and it does, it fails. And then we've got a problem of leaders saying, well, I tried, I, I brought these leader, these consultants in, I put these programs in place and we're not, nothing's changed. So done all I can and then they move on and they don't focus on it. So that's my biggest worry. But so I guess, I don't know, did I give any hope in that? <laughs> give us a little, <laughs> no, you did, you did. Listen, awareness is a big piece of it. Just knowing it is. is a big piece. But I guess, and you don't have to share clients or anything, but are you seeing the needle move a little bit in some pockets or some areas that uh, would let us know? Because anyway, I just, I, I, I do see I, it. I do see the needle moving. And here's what I find works, because I've talked about what doesn't work. What I yeah. found works when it comes to diversity and, and just very few people who can do it well, because it's hard, which is to impart it whatever that is, um, whatever diversity is for you, whatever you want it to be, put that into every aspect of your business, which means it's got to go into your strategic thinking. So when you say we want to add customers, we want um, our quality to improve, we want, you know, think about, oh, okay, well, so what does that mean around diversity for us? What does that mean around inclusion for us? And, And so making it kind of a part of all of what you do, not just hiring, more, not right. just, you know, creating these groups where people feel like they could go. There's a woman's group within the, there's a black group within the companies to me. I mean, that might be helpful, but it doesn't, I don't see moving the dial. So that's what I see is, is it's gotta be throughout the company. And I have seen some able to do that and make headway that way. We know more more women in particular are on boards now than ever. And that was due to a lot of effort and a lot of education. So we've got to continue all of that. That's why it's going to take time though. And we're going to have to have a little bit of patience. Yeah. And I, I think I may be jumping ahead here because we could go and start diving into the book. There were a few questions I wanted to ask, but to me, I think one of your first points in the book was that strategy, strategies to develop leaders has must have a business application to it. I may not be wording it right. You can correct me if I'm wrong. But I think possibly there's been a disconnect with this topic, diversity, and how it impacts that bottom line. But I, I think we're getting closer to the point where it is, if it hasn't already impacted it, it is. Did I did I misstate that point? Did I state that point correctly? No, I think you did. Um, you know, it's really about business planning, strategy, whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. And what do you do with your people, which mm-hmm. I call the people strategy? What are you going to do to help them get those results you're looking for? So business over here, people over here. How do you put them together and get the results that you're looking for? And we know that more diversity will get better results. Um, And if you connect to your point of, I think what you're also saying is connecting diversity initiatives to the business plan, to the people plan, right? We'll move that ball along. Yeah, thanks for thanks for clarifying that and making me sound better because I think I'm a mix mix match. You got it though. Uh, no, you got it. All right, let's. Uh, I, this is a great segue, I think, into your book. Leaders deserve better, and I've got some questions and I got highlights in my iPad over here. But the first thing that I love to ask when someone writes a book with a little mm-hmm. bit of a, um, I don't, I guess the title has. I'll just ask it this way. Why, why did you write the book and how did you come up with the title leaders deserve better? Yeah. So 
I have seen a lot of great things happen in development and a lot of poor things happen over the years that I've been doing this. This is a culmination of all of that coming together and seeing a different way of doing it over the last 10 years in particular that I just wanted to shout from the rooftops. I mean, you talk about redefining things. I talk about a revolution and I don't mean that lightly. It needs to change that big or we are, our companies are in jeopardy. So um, then when I started thinking, it, it, frankly, all the titles that came up with were slightly negative. You know, and I can't even think of what some of them were, but, um, you know, it's your leadership stinks. It wasn't that, but it was, you know, <laughs> you must do something about this. And so then I started thinking, OK, no one's going to pick up that book. No one's going to want me preaching at them because that's not mm -hmm. how we learn. So I thought, but this isn't something that leaders have intended to do. We all want to be at our best and we all want to treat our people in the best way. And so why are we not? And so it's, it's more of, it's, it's not anyone's fault, I guess, is what I'm saying. That's where I got to, but leaders deserve more, better, different. And so that's where, how I landed on that title was, yeah. was showing that we can change the way we're doing things and we must. Okay, so here's my second somewhat cynical question. Does the world really need another book? Another leadership book or another um, book. Oh, another book. Here. <laughs> I mean, I mean I'm, I've finished writing. I love books. Years, so I'm, I'm, I'm in the same yeah. boat, but. but I'm okay. glad you're asking this question. Leadership question. Do I, right, and, and listen, I've read it, so I could kind of pull out some things that I think are different and unique, but I would love to hear from you why. Did you look yeah. at the whole, look at the shelves and go, you know what, Jennifer, you need to write a leadership book. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I've been thinking a lot about what do I want to say? What's important for people to hear? And is it either written in a different way that it will sink in? Because truly it's not sinking in. <clears throat> and most leadership books are about how to be a good leader. What are the competencies, strengths finders, as an example, um, teaching people how to be a leader, what a leader is. I wanted to get at the problem that I see, which is that companies overall, leadership teams overall are not being held accountable and they are the solution and the problem. And so it was actually Forbes books that came to me and said, we'd like you to consider writing a book. And of course, anybody that's been consulting for 25 years has pages of notes and things of, oh, I want to write about this. I want to write about this. So <clears throat> I've been thinking about it a long time and wanting to do it and feeling like I have a message that I wanted to get out there that is different um, and could make a big difference in individuals and companies. Um, I had to. I had to do it. I had to write it, even if it gets a little lost sometimes. Um, talking about it like this, I think, is a way to, to cut through some maybe others that are similar to others that have been out there. But I also think it's like, um, I don't know if this fits with how you see it, but when I read a book, let's just even take the Bible as an example. You read a section and it totally has a different meaning for you at that time when you read it. You could read it over and over. So I also think there's pieces of leadership that need to just be over and over. And sometimes the shiny objects, the new things are going to get the attention. So that's what I would say is why I put the effort into doing this. Yeah. Did you learn anything about yourself during the writing process? Uh, that I need help um, <laughs> in order to get a book finished for sure. Um, I would rather talk through this than write it. Um, and I love that I did something new, different. I mean, I have been in this, in this world a long time in this business a long time. And, um, so learning how to be concise about my message, mm -hmm. being the front person is not my necessarily my thing, even though I, I said over here when I was younger, I wanted to be up front singing, but, um, being, the lead thought leader and, and being out there and putting myself out there. Cause as you know, there is a lot of vulnerability that goes with coming on a, sh on a podcast like yours 
not knowing what you're going to ask me. And I know you're going to ask me something personal. Right. And um, so I learned a ton about myself. I learned a ton about what I like, what I don't like. And I love that I did something completely different that I did not know how it was going to go. And I did not know um, what I was doing. And then a pandemic hit while a book came out and you can't market it the way you would normally do it, you know? So um, I put myself in a, in a pretty challenging situation and, and I like that. Yeah. I thrive on that. That's and cool. I'm not, and, it, and I don't always win. <laughs> I, I like, I think part of a good character trait for people that might be leaders is the willingness, maybe the pursuit of stretching themselves and working some different muscles. And what you just mm -hmm. described to me is that you are working different muscles. I've noticed it. Just the writing process is just, it really stretches me because I, I, I enjoy talking. I enjoyed mm -hmm. this year. So uh, anyway, all right. So one of the things I'm going to go ahead and dive in. I'm, I've got some highlighted items and in the, in the time we've got left, I want to cover some of the things that you have in the book. I'm going to recommend people get it. Leaders deserve better. We'll mention at the end where people can find it. There'll be links, okay. but Great. I would be disappointed if I didn't, if I wasn't able to spend some time really asking some, a little more pointed questions that, uh, that I read about. The first one that I want to ask about, you talk about the mindset of a leader. Mm -hmm. And as you said earlier, many books on leadership, they go through technique, they go through tools, they they're very tactical, and they really do not address that mindset. Talk to mm -hmm. us about the mindset of a leader. Yeah, the mindset is the only way that, that the information coming in is going to be used in a lot of ways. If you have the mindset of what I mentioned earlier, with, which is as a leader, my number one job is to develop my people um, and get the results, of course, but develop my people, right? And so when it comes to that, the mindset shift is that is my main job, A. B, I need to free up my time to spend on that. So you can say it's important freeing up time, but also what work do you value? And, and so that's where you know what's important to you is where you put your time and what work you value. And then if you have the skills and you learn what it takes to, to help others get where they need to go, um, it's going to work. So that if you don't have the mindset shift, it's not going to work. So there's a lot of things that if you don't do this, it's not going to work. <laughs> so there's several things that make it complex. Um, but that's, and the other thing about the mindset is I have to be accountable for it. Mm -hmm. So we're not compensated often on how do we do with our people? What do our people think about us and what in the environment they're in? And yes, we do engagement surveys, things like that. Those are helpful. And I think they just need to be accountable instead of saying that's HR's job. This is my job. So I need to partner with HR and leadership development groups and outside consultants and whatever coaches, and I need to be responsible for helping them get from point A to point B. So that's the mindset shift. Yeah. And I love that. And you reference one of my favorite books, I think, uh, uh, Dweck's book on mindset, because that fixed versus growth is such a, yeah. you know, someone who's a, someone who has a fixed mindset doesn't decide to write a book. <laughs> typically I wouldn't think right. right and they're not doing well right now if you think about a fixed mindset right now with all this stuff hitting us and all this change going on no no way you're going to help that company be or or the organization you're part of or the you know family if you are fixed we have to adjust I I feel bad for those families who are hunkered down and they haven't come up with unique ways to make something positive out of this experience. And I've seen it more than not. And it just saddens me, you know? Um, so if we can look outside of what we've known, what we've seen, what we've done, and that's opposite of the fixed mindset, then um, gosh, we're going to live a better life. You know, the tough thing, Jennifer, is that I definitely put myself in growth. I'm pursuing things. My wife and I are that way. But the last 
12 to 18 months has been difficult for even the growth minded people. You know True. what I mean? I mean, right. fixed has been, it's been very interesting. And so I love that conversation. I love the, yeah. the, that principle that you laid out in the book. Uh, I, I do want to share this. One of the things that I really loved was that I, I think you really portrayed leadership, developing others as a process, not an event. That was probably one of the most frustrating things that I went through when I was with the Bell South Leadership Institute was that we did a lot of training, but we did not have the coaching uh, aspect. This was early 90s. It wasn't even yeah. really in the vernacular. A thing, right. Time. It wasn't a thing. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't a thing, which, which you may or may not know, but my, I'm really consider myself a coach now. That's really yeah. what I do. I work with executive teams, leaders, and, and I say this all the time. This is not an event. This is a process. Yes. You can't and, just check the box. Right. Yeah. And I guess it's one of the reasons why, you know, with, with your team, I, I mean, listen, there's all types of one and done trainings out there, but one of the themes throughout this was that this mindset and I'm pointing to the book is why I'm pointing here in the video I'm pointing yeah. to my iPad <laughs> this is all about injecting a process into the organization talk a little bit more about the importance of this being something like not me calling up say hey Jennifer can you guys come in and I need you oh, to yeah. do a three hour we're doing a we're doing an off-site and I need y'all to do a three hour how to be a better leader talk and then and then leave yeah I mean, you, that's the oh thing. my gosh the amount of that work I did historically <laughs> is is crazy I cringe when I think of some of the things I didn't think gosh what impact did I make? So thank you for asking about that. Cause it is, that's, that's the key, right. Of, of my message is it's not about what you're teaching, what you're sharing, what they're learning. It's about the culture and the company and how they handle it. So, and this can be measured too, how the company is doing. Mm -hmm. And so that's the other piece. Cause a lot of CEOs in particular will say, I know it's, I know my leaders aren't prepared the way I want them to be, but I don't know what to do differently because if they knew they would do it. So if, um, so the very first thing is connecting the strategy of the business to the people strategy, that's including HR, all the, all the functional area leaders together, getting collective understanding of how are we going to get from here to there, current state, future state, and what's our current state people where are they? What do they know? What do they not know? Who do we need in here? And what's that future state? And how are we going to develop them? That's the people plan. So that's one. Two, leaders have to lead it. So you talked about the mindset. Leaders have to be fully responsible. Even if they're not creating the content, they're not maybe delivering programs, they're not doing that. But they're constantly having development conversations. They're providing resources for people to learn, providing opportunities to learn within the organization. They're helping them reinforce. I don't know how many times I've had leaders come to different programs we've done or different topics we're talking about and their boss is interrupting them and making them come out to take a call, right? That, and then they go, or they go back to their jobs and they don't have any time to even think about it, how to implement, how to implement, impart what they've learned into their job. So really strong leaders who take responsibility, as I'm saying, will have a separate meeting. Would you learn? Would you like? What do you think you want to change? You know, um, how can I help you first and foremost? So that's the second thing. Third is, is the reinforcement completely. And that's with the leader reinforcing, but also your peers and the group that you're in. I think learning is best if you're with like level. So you can be vulnerable, you can share examples, you can learn from each other, and then have that after you have a time together, continue that learning together. Um, make sure it's in job descriptions, make sure it's in performance reviews, all of that, or why are you having them go to it if, if it's not that important? Um, and lastly, it's you know probably a more controversial um, part of my book, but this face-to-face -face component, you know, um, I wrote this before the pandemic and, um, but I still would say, and I, and I, and Zoom and other technology um, programs are getting better and better to help us be face-to-face. -face. I feel more like I'm with you in a room than I would have a year ago with the technology. So um, I believe in face-to-face -face learning and I believe in face-to-face follow-up 
where possible. And even if there's just a component like this, so stop this, you know, I hear about bite-sized learning and I get it. I get we're saturated, um, but make sure the bite-sized learning is going somewhere tied to the business, tied to the people plan. So those are the key things that I think are missing within companies. If you do that, it will stick. It will work. They will be prepared and you can measure it. So in my book, I have a way of measuring those four aspects. How are you doing? What really do I mean by what it looks like if you're reinforcing or if your leaders are leading it? And um, so that's kind of the a, a bit of difference is giving them a path for how to how to improve. Yeah, and I, I love the way you laid out those steps. And somewhere in those steps, there was something that I really kind of, I was actually reading it laying down, but I read, I sat up and said, Ooh, I love this. And that was where you talked about the importance of being a coach. And you talked about how important it is for leaders to be a coach. And I've got real thoughts on that because I've been coaching now for probably going on 30 something years. And I was wired to lead and coach. That was something that I I've come to believe that I was created to do and be. And I say that I, I really find the greatness in people and I help pull that out in organizations. But this is my question. I think you address this in the book even. There are some people that struggle with that coach gene, the skill, <laughs> whatever. And you talk about bringing in outsiders. I've done that. I've come in as the outside guy to coach for Joe's mm -hmm. people because Joe isn't that great at it. And I can tell you that's tough, <laughs> tough to do. It is, it is. Um, but how, how do you teach people? How do you inject being able to coach into people that they just haven't thought that way? Mm -hmm. They don't have that mindset. They don't have that thought process. How do you guys go yeah. about doing that? Well, I think at first is about um, why it's important. Because if, if mm -hmm. they don't know that it's going to help them be successful, then you know, you're not going to get that attention to start with. So why the why is if you can enable your team, if you think about just wanting to get a little bit of better performance from the whole team, you as a leader could work your tail off another 10 hours, or you could get each one of your 10 direct reports to do an hour and do it well. So understanding the importance of if you coach to get better results mm -hmm. from your team members, you're going to get better results and win whatever that looks like for you. Um, then it's about giving them a method. And there are a couple of good ones out there. We use the grow model, but I mean, that's been around forever, but there's a, there's models for, there really is a skill to it. Mm -hmm. So teaching that skill and then reinforcing it, talking about the importance of it, asking your the people that report to you, how did I do? You know, I'm trying to be better at this. So if you could be vulnerable and tell people, this is what I'm working on, you can improve. So I think it's little improvements. And if you brought a coach in, which I think is still, if you're not good at it, your people need it, especially certain ones might need it for a period of time. That's, that's a great use of a coach. Learn from them you know, along the way. So those would be some of the things, but it, but it's a lot of practice. I know the model. I, you know, I would say that, that it's not my, my best characteristic coaching. I, I'm not a coach. I don't do it regularly. I am used to solving problems. I love solving problems. So with solving problems, you think you have the answers, right? And that's not how you coach. Um, and that's not important. My, my answer to the question is not important. So anyway, I, I found it a real struggle. And um, so I do all the things I'm talking about. I say, you know, I, I, I feel like I was too directive or how could I be a better coach for you? Or what do you need from me when, during our weekly one-on-ones? You know, all of that stuff and just get feedback and just try to get better at it. Yeah, that's good. I have people I always chuckle when people say their level of coaching is doing an annual review with their people that report mm. to them. It's like, oh, so you spend one hour a hour. year with them. No, we do it. We do it every six months. We really are pretty aggressive. With it. I'm going, <laughs> oh, okay. You really are. And you're actually uh, not coaching in that one hour. You're going no. over a document, a performance. Oh, uh, gosh. Yeah. Another, but we're preaching another, to the choir. I know another big thing you bring up, and this is probably my last question, maybe my last question is you talk about the importance of the buy-in 
of the ultimate leader, the, the leader at the top. And I have kind of gotten into that mode of only if I can't work with the person or people or group in charge, I don't do a lot of work down in organizations just because sometimes the check is good, but the impact is not. And so I really have gotten to where I only work with leadership teams and I must have the leader on board. And you really hit that pretty hard in your book. Talk about that briefly about the importance of the leader implementing this, not handing it off to HR, handing it off to a consultant or someone like that. Yeah. 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 They have to work with those people um, to get the right solution, but it has to be top of mind. It has to be in their top five things that are important to the business success. Um, And so if I can, if I can come in and, and work with HR and leadership development groups and learn what they think they need, and then I can talk with the senior team and confirm and align them and say, let's talk about your role in this, because it's the support more than anything that I need for outcomes to happen. So I've had too many instances where I come in the middle or I work with a a first line leader and they don't even know what the goals are. They don't know what we're working toward. So how can I help them? And it's it's frustrating. And so I help them with how to figure that out. Um, but it is about impact. If we can't transform, if we can't come into an organization and, and have impact, which we've done many times and not had impact, um, we don't want to do it. And we're at a place where we can say that we're not the ones for you. Um, and so, yeah, we, we rarely get involved. And and if, if they're not connected in and they're not a partner with HR and HR partner with them, it won't work either. And so I just learned over the years, that's, that's one big key to success is their involvement. That's uh that's important. Thanks for sharing that. Jennifer, I, I just want to acknowledge what a, what an important role you play you and your organization in our culture, because this is a very difficult and always challenging thing, leadership. It's a, again, we joked at the beginning, it is a word that's yeah. thrown around quite a bit. It's taken a beating in certain circles, but but we can't stop that. I mean, that doesn't no. mean it. And you are out there, uh, and I don't want to say on the front lines, because we've got, there, there's other front lines in the culture yeah. right now, in the health field and things like that. But but definitely this is important. I, I think the last thing I would like for you to do, and then we'll wrap up with where people can find the book. And one question that I'll wrap up with is, is I know that there are some leaders that are fatigued, they're tired, they feel beaten up over the last mm-hmm. maybe long period of time, but they, they don't know if they're doing well or not. Can you just take just kind of as your last statement, just maybe encourage them and, and give right. them a little bit of hope or a lot of hope uh, with just the last minute or two here. And then I'll just wrap up. Absolutely. With yeah, it is. It's, it's the most difficult position right now to be in, to try and continue to give your all to everyone and be depleted in the process. So I would encourage them to keep after it. It will get better. It will get easier, but also to feel like you can share how you're feeling with whoever you're comfortable with. I mean, I, I feel comfortable sharing with, with my whole team. Um, but even if it's a peer, even if, you know, it, it probably needs to not be just within your family unit, your spouse or significant other, or, um, cause they're going to get, they're going to get beaten down with it too, but just, you know, communicate, talk about it, share, have some joy, add some joy into your day, add some fun, add some things that aren't business into your conversations. I find that will go a long way, a little laughter, you know, start with a joke of the day, start with a video that's, that's impactful or funny. Um, You know, those are strategies and small ones at that tactics that um, make a big difference. So, I think, and the more that you can have that big picture of where are you going? Why am I in this? What am I, what am I doing this for? Because a lot of people are questioning themselves around their work and impact it has now, but think about that and think about the big picture. That'll keep you going when it's hard 
And right now it's just hard and you might not feel like you can get out of it, but think of other times that were hard. You got out of that too. So you can get out of this one and it's in your control. I'd also say it's, it's, you know, you can make this different, even just by your mindset of I'm going to take this as an opportunity and I'm going to create new ways of doing things. I'm going to look at technology out there and I'm going to see how that can impact me um, and my team. So yeah, that's what I would say to those who feel like that. And I have been there through these 18 months, different points. So understand. That is so good. Thank you. I mean, and yes, we just need people like you, Jennifer, and these leaders that are operating with heart and integrity. And we, I, I think culture is, we, we, we continue needing that. Thank you. Thank you for writing the book. Thank you for doing what you do. Uh, leaders deserve better is the book. Why don't you tell us where they can find it, how people can connect with you. We'll include it in the notes, but just uh, verbally tell us so people that are listening sure. can, can know that. The easiest way is just to go to jennifermackin.com. It's M-A-C-K-I-N, jennifermackin.com. And you can get to our my businesses as well through that, but that'll give you a first chapter of the book. It'll give you a little taste of the assessment that I've created for companies. So um, go there, check it out, send me some messages. Uh, I'd love to hear from people. I love to hear what you think of the book, your ideas. So keep those coming. And you know, this has been a joy for me to be a part of this conversation. And you've really brought out some, some different things that I haven't talked about. And so um, it's been a joy to, to be a part of it. So thank you. Excellent. All right. Our final question here, I, I prepped you just a little bit, but we are seek, go create those three words. And Jennifer, what I like to ask is which one of those words currently, and it could change obviously over time, but currently, which one of those words resonates or jumps out at you more than the other two? Yeah, I love them all, but create jumps out at me. Yeah, and why is that? really to a detriment sometimes, but it, I'm always saying, let's stay in the realm of possibility for a while. Let's not go into why we can't. What is possible? What could we do? Um, how are we, should we be different? And I'm, whenever I read anything or listen to something, it leads me to think of, oh, well, that leads me to a different way of thinking about it. And so then I'll come to my team or my family with another idea and another idea. And sometimes you don't need another idea, but, um, but that's how I think is that we're never, you know, we're never good enough. We've never done enough. And um, so I, I always think about creating new more than I do staying the way we are. And I think that's important as long as I'm not always looking for the negative or the thing to fix, um, which is where it can go a little too far sometimes, but create where I <laughs> stand right now. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for that, Jennifer. Thank you so much for being on our show, Seek, Go, Create. If you are listening in, I recommend you go connect with Jennifer. Make sure you get her book, Leaders Deserve Better. I read it yesterday. It's excellent. You'll definitely pull some things out of it. And I'm going to ask a big favor if you're listening in. I know you've gotten some value from this. Share this episode with someone else. Uh, all you have to do is just hit share on whatever player you're listening on, or if you're watching it on social media or on YouTube, just share it with someone else, because I know you know someone who needs this message on leadership and they need the information that we discussed today. And thank you again for joining us. You know that we always have new episodes every Monday morning. So make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. I appreciate you listening. I appreciate you taking the time to share and just participate in all that we're doing here at Seek Go Create. Until next time, continue being all that you were created to be.